Awesome. Thank you all for joining us today. I like seeing a lot of familiar faces in the, the video over here. Um, for our Lunch and Learn today, we are going to be talking about working better together online with Andy Goodman of the Goodman Center. Um, Regina will be introducing him shortly, but we're going to be going through the Goodman Center's survey um, of over 4,000 uh, nonprofits, foundations, colleges, and universities. Um, they've been studying how we've all been working remotely and have a lot of great learnings to share. I'm so excited to see what they're going to be sharing. Um, before we dive in, though, I wanted to make sure that everybody knows about some of the resources that CNM has at your disposal. Um, we are holding free office hours appointments with our consultants. You can schedule those anytime that you like on our website. Um, we also have our regular calendar of um, courses and events that we've got going. We just launched our November and some of December calendar. Um, plenty of awesome um, seminars and some new virtual certificates to dive into. Um, we're also participating in a couple of cool new scholarship programs, um, partnering with the Nonprofit Partnership um, and with First Five um, and the RAP Foundation, a couple of really cool groups, um, offering free technical service, technical assistance and capacity building services, um, both for Riverside County organizations as well as organizations serving First Five's Best Start regions. Um, you can check out the applications and requirements for all of those on our blog. Um, at cnmsocal.org slash blog. Um, and then last up, a couple of cool relevant upcoming trainings that we've got going on. Um, starting in November, we're gonna have a remote working fundamentals course, um, a new virtual certificate um, that will meet for a few sessions on creating inclusive and equitable cultures at your organization. Um, and then finally, with our awesome HR um, consultant and expert, uh, Clark, um, we'll be holding a seminar on returning to the work site with ease. Um, managing employee stress, um, return to work policies, all that. Um, last up, um, just setting some norms for our session today, um, reminding you that this session is being recorded um, so we can share this with others, but excited to um, you know, be able to have a great conversation, um, but just remember that you'll be being recorded. Um, please keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. Um, we'll have some periods where we can do questions and answers, um, but please put your questions in the chat so we can get to as many of those as possible. Um, and we'd love to see your faces, but being on video is definitely not required. Um, other than that, you know, just please respect everybody else's opinions and experiences and uh, be open to learning new things. So with that, I'm going to kill my screen share and hand it over to Regina to get things going. Well, thanks, Aaron. Um, I will make this quick. Happy Friday, everybody. Great to see you. It's always nice to have these lunch and learn sessions. And um, I'm really excited to um, have the opportunity to share Andy Goodman with you. Um, he's one of those just such a gift to our sector. He is a communications god, in, and I'm not overstating that. I don't use those terms often, but in terms of thinking about causes and messaging, um, you know, at a time when it's so important that we um, get more people on this bus with us, um, the, our communities are counting on it. So as we all had to shift to the world of Zoom, uh, we thought it was a really timely opportunity to take advantage of what Andy learned. And um, I will turn it over to you, Andy Goodman. Thanks very much, Regina. Thanks everybody for making time to be with us today. Let me share my screen so you can see uh, what I have for you guys today. Let's see there and good. Can everybody see that okay? So this is the report we did, and here's what we're going to do in a very fast hour together today over lunch. We want to do four things. First, I want to give you a little context on, on how we got here and why we decided to write this report. Actually, our story goes back to 2008, so we're going to do a very quick 12-year history for you. Also, I want to define some terms. When we start talking about online meetings, there's really different kinds of things happening, and these different things require different guidelines. So we're going to sort of have a little bit of a glossary of terms so we're all saying the same thing. And then we're gonna get into the nine big takeaways. If you've already read the report, um, and it's free by the way, um, there were nine big takeaways from our research and we're gonna go through those with you and share those, each one. And each one comes with recommendations on what you can do to have more productive, more engaging, more inclusive uh, video conferences. And we'll also throw some resources at us for our SoCal friends. Uh, so that beyond this report, some other things you can access to have better experiences online. So that's what we're gonna do. If you have a question at any point, please put it in the chat box. I've asked Aaron and Regina to keep an eye on that. 
So if a question occurs to you, they'll keep an eye on the chat box, we'll stop periodically, and they will relay your questions to me. So please know that anything you put there, we will get to it. So let's dive in with a little bit of context. And as I said, our story really begins in 2008, because if you remember back, that's when we had the Great Recession. And that's when we saw our first big uptick in video conferencing. You know, everyone was looking for ways to save money. How do we lower our costs and save money? So the idea of not flying people around, but doing it via video really started to catch on there. And as a result of that, we saw this happening in the nonprofit sector. And we said, well, let's do some research and see if we can understand what's working and what's not. So in 2009, we did this report, dialing in, logging on, nodding off, the true cost of teleconferences, video conferences, and webinars. And we started to study problems and trends with this kind of meeting. The other thing that happened in 2009 is we started to teach people how to do this with what we call the webinar on webinars. And we've been teaching it for 11 years. So over that time, we've really made a study of what works and what doesn't. And we've learned from the people taking our class as they've discovered new best practices. So we've logged hundreds of hours developing our expertise all the way up to March 2020, March of this year, when everything changed. And all of a sudden, by the second week of March, nobody could go out, we're all working at home, and now everything we do was looking like this. And so we thought, well, if everyone's doing this, what better time to ask people again, what's working and what's not? And so in June, June, uh, sorry, July and August this summer, we decided to do some research, to put a survey up on the web and ask people like you to fill it out and let us know what's working, what isn't. We partnered with these 13 organizations to ask them to put this survey out to their members so that we could reach as many people as possible at nonprofits, foundations, government agencies, colleges and universities. And thanks to their, that partnership, over 4,400 people took the time to fill out the survey and give us this very rich data set that allowed us to write this report and come up with data-driven recommendations for making your video conferences better. So before we get into the report, I do want to go over terms because one of the things people told us when we started the research, when we asked them what works and what doesn't, their first answer was, it depends. You know, are you talking about a small meeting of five or 10 people where we're looking at faces on the screen? Are you talking about a webinar with 50 or 100 people where we're not seeing anybody? Or a webcast where there's 1,000 people? You know, depending on what you're talking about, these things change. So we said, all right, let's agree on terms. So for going forward for today, when I say webinar, I'm talking about, you know, what kind of this looks like, something that's mostly about information sharing, teaching or training is mostly a one-way delivery of information, usually featuring a speaker like me or a panel of speakers. And interaction tends to be limited uh, to you know, Q&A and things like that. Now, on the other hand, there are web meetings. If you were having a board meeting or a staff meeting, just a bunch of faces on the screen in Zoom, that's mostly about discussion or decision-making. That's where there's a lot of sharing going on, a lot of interaction. There may or may not be slides or other document sharing, but the emphasis is on interaction. And these tend to be smaller because you do want everyone to participate. And then there's the very large scale webcast. When you have several hundred people or thousands of people, you know, the equivalent of a keynote speech that's been moved online. Um, there it's again, mostly a one way delivery of information, very limited interaction due to the size of the gathering. Um, and uh, you know, a speech, a presentation, a performance would be in the category of webcast. Now, the reason we have this as a Venn diagram is because there's a lot of overlap between these formats. I'm sure you're, you're, you're thinking yourself, you know, I've been in webinars that were very interactive, or I've been in web meetings that had lots of presentations. So yeah, there's a little bit of, of each in these. And if you're also asking, well, what about, you know, the multi-day web conference or the multi-day training where we're now doing it all day for two or three days in a row? Well. We see those as a combination of all three elements. You know, that thing that used to be a keynote for the whole group, there's your webcast. Those concurrent sessions where you used to go to different rooms to break out, there are your webinars. Small team meetings, there are your meetings. So those are the terms we want to use going forward. So today, even though I think we're actually set up in Zoom in the quote unquote meeting format, this is more of a webinar in terms of the actual way we're doing it.
All right, so does that make sense to everybody? All right, good. So let's get into the real meat of this report, these nine takeaways, what we learned from the research. Uh, and the first takeaway is this, it's about engagement and participation. Take a moment to read that for yourselves. This is the first challenge and the biggest challenge. And we've heard this again and again from people in both our quantitative and qualitative research. Keeping people engaged and participating is a minute by minute battle. You know, they're home, they're distracted. They have all different types of things coming at them uh, and all different opportunities to multitask. So keeping them focused is your first and foremost challenge. We saw this in the data. We asked this question in the survey, in general, what makes an online convening of any kind a positive experience? And look at the answers. Engaging presentation and facilitation, the number one answer across the board. And the number three answer, using platform tools to promote interaction, is the how of engagement. And when we ask the inverse question, what makes an online convening a negative experience? Well, technical problems was number one, you all know about that, but lack of engagement was, was close behind. So clearly people want to be engaged. They want it when the lack of it is a problem for them. That said, there's an awful lot of multitasking going on. We ask this question, how often do you find yourself multitasking? And whether it was meetings, webinars, or webcasts, look at this. They are frequently or always multitasking at least about half the time. So people wanna be engaged, but they're doing other things. So what do we do? Well, here's the first tip. Give people something to do right from the start. If you wanna start your meeting and people are gonna be late as they invariably are, and the people who show up on time have nothing to do, if, if you basically say, hey, thanks for showing up on time, but we're missing a few people, so hang in there, folks. Then really the first message you've given them is let the multitasking begin. So instead, for the people who show up on time, have some slides that say, you know, points to ponder while we wait for everyone to log on. Give them some bonus information, maybe some factoids or some quotes, or do a little conversation with them. Use that time productively to reward them for being on time and don't send the message that here's an opportunity to start multitasking. Here's one of my favorite tips. When you have good information, don't always just present the information. Look for ways to turn it around and ask questions. What you're seeing now is a slide from a webinar we did several years ago about how to design web pages so that people will look where, where you'll put stuff where people are looking. According to an actual study by Jacob Nielsen, who's one of the gurus of web usability, actual heat mapping studies where they track people's eyes, they found that when people hit a web page for the first time that they've never seen before, they tend to look at it in this F-shaped pattern, like you see here. Well, that's useful information. If you're a designer of web pages and you want to put stuff where people are looking, that's good to know. But this just gives you the information. Here it is, read it, take it in, go do better next time. But what if instead, when we got to this part of the webinar, we had presented it like this and said, pop quiz, you know, which, are the, which pattern are your eyes likely to follow? And we called on somebody and said, Real Regina, what do you think? And Regina goes, hmm, well, I think it's B because of this. And you have someone do some critical thinking and the audience is doing the same thing. They're all guessing too. And then you get to go to the information. So if you've got good information, sometimes hold it back and ask people to, to take a guess or to give their own thoughts before you actually get there. Uh, certainly you can use polls. Zoom is very easy to, to do, to set up polls. Um, and if you don't know how, just go to Zoom. There's, web, there's uh, tutorials that'll show you. But that's a good way to let people do something and compare their answers to everyone else. If you have a large group and you want people to interact, get them into smaller groups because when it's just four or five or six people, you can't hide anymore and now everyone can talk to each other. So use breakout rooms. And here was something interesting from our survey. When we asked people about ways to create engagement, believe it or not, creative use of the chat box came across as the number one way. People said creative use of the chat box is really a great way to, use it, to, to get people engaged. Now, most people use the chat box for questions and comments, you know, it's, that's what it is. But you can also use it, for example, to share links. If you wanna get, give people a link to a video or a resource, you can put it in the chat box, they can copy it and go from there. 
You can conduct snap surveys where you ask people a very quick question and you ask them to answer in the chat box. Don't, don't be in the poll, just give me a two word answer in the chat box. In our last uh, webinar, someone said that they use something called a chat storm. This was new to us, I never heard this. Here's what a chat storm is. You ask a question and you tell people, we want you to put your answer in the chat box, but don't hit enter yet. And, and when everyone's done, I'm gonna count three, two, one, and then I want everyone to hit enter at the same time. So for example, I'd say, uh, here's our chat storm. Don't actually do this, I'm just gonna demonstrate. Um, of all the webinars you've attended, who puts on the best webinars, the most engaging, most productive webinars? Put it in the chat box, hold on. Okay, everybody ready? Three, two, one. Oh, look, it's the Center for Nonprofit Management. How about that? Um, you can put footnotes or citations in the chat box. You know, rather than put them on your slides, and crowd your slides with all that you know, fine print. If you have to have contemporaneous citations, put that off to the side in the chat box and keep your slides even cleaner. And a lot of people said one of the great challenges of these video conferences is not being able to read the room. I don't know if people are with me, are they getting it? Well, use the chat box to ask those questions. Are you still with me? Was that clear? You can ask those questions on the side to make sure people are still with you. Another way to engage people is to let them go do something offline. You know, when we do our storytelling uh, workshops at the Goodman Center, there's a, a 20 minute exercise where people need to take a template like you see on the screen here and go off and fill it out and then come back. So we tell them, leave the computer on, leave the connection going, but you know, get away for 20 minutes, fill this thing out, go outside if the weather is good um, and then come back. So. That way we keep them engaged and they're not sitting there stuck staring at the screen. And something else we recommend is to stop and take questions frequently. Um, if you just wait till the end of a half an hour, an hour, sometimes people will put a question in the chat box and get frustrated like, is it ever gonna get answered? But if you can stop every 10, 15, 20 minutes to take questions, breaks up the flow, gets questions answered, lets other people speak, just makes for a more, more back and forth. Um, and another possibility is also to call on people. So like I said before, with asking questions like about the, uh, the design quiz, you know, call on people and let them, let them participate. One thing about asking questions, by the way, and this came from the survey, um, and I'm gonna I call on actually Regina for an answer here. Um, we asked people, how often do you prefer asking questions out loud as opposed to have to put your question into a, a chat box? You know, so Regina, if you're in a meeting, with like, let's say it's a five, 10, 15 people. Would you prefer to ask the question yourself and be heard and seen or just put it in the chat box? Usually in the chat box. Usually, so you're a chat box. And if you're in a webinar with a big group of people, what's your preference there? Fill in the chat box. Fill in the chat box. Okay, our survey a little bit different. Take a look here. In meetings, 50% uh, people said, 50% uh, of the time in the frequently to always range said, I prefer to speak in meetings. Mm -hmm. But in webinars, the majority of people, in this case, 51% said, no, I'd rather put in the chat box. So this notion of how people ask questions, be aware of the format you're in and know which way people are leaning. So with that, seeing that we're about 20 minutes in, let me stop and ask Aaron or Regina, um, any questions in our chat box so far uh, that uh, I can answer? Well, I did want to ask a question because I, what I um, am finding in this format is there's a lot of stopping and starting, right? If you and I and Aaron are all thinking we'd ask a question at the same time, um, then it's sort of, oh, sorry, no, Aaron, you go. No, I'll go. There's that. So um, is there a smart way to cue people even in a smaller meeting where how we're going to talk Yes. One person at a time. <laughs> sure. One way to do that is um, when you get to a Q&A section, stop, stop sharing your, your, your uh, slides. So you go to gallery view, you see everybody's face. Tell people, please turn on your screen so we can see you. If you have a question, do this. Or actually, mm -hmm. praise the, there's a raise hand uh, feature in Zoom, which you can use. So in smaller meetings, you know, let's see all the faces, raise your hand, and we we'll just do it like we're in a room. Simple as that. All right, let's move on. We'll stop again soon. Um, our second takeaway is about inclusivity and accessibility. Please take a moment to read this.
here's an area where the data showed us not as much attention is being paid to this as should be paid. We asked this question, how often have you seen convening leaders or facil facilitators say or do things to create an inclusive space? Now, I, I wanna give uh, CNM some props here. You had a slide that spoke to this directly. And so what you did is not only good, but actually exceptional, because look at this. 43% of the people said that this is a sometimes thing, that they, just, they, they get to it sometimes. 33% rarely, 6% never. So something that I think should be an always thing, or at least frequently, is too often a sometimes thing or less. We're not paying enough attention to setting up our meetings and creating and an consciously creating an inclusive space. Now you can do this by showing a slide like you guys, like Aaron went over at the beginning, or by having a slide like this where you ask people to check in and see how they're doing, sort of take their temperature. You can also uh, give people the rules of engagement at the beginning or set them up together, have community agreements and build them with people there so people know exactly what is expected of them and how they can participate to the fullest. Now, when it comes to accessibility, being able to see clearly, hear clearly, read, understand, we're really falling short here. Look at this, this chart. How often have you seen convening leaders create greater accessibility with things like closed captioning or ASL, et cetera. And look at this. How often was accessibility in the frequently to always range? 12% of the time at best, at best. So we got a lot of work to do here. So know your platforms, accessibility tools, whether you're using Zoom, Microsoft Teams, WebEx, Adobe, what have you, if you go to your platform, there are plenty of tools in these platforms with things like closed captioning and um, uh, text magnification. A lot of these the tools are built in, we're just not using them. Also, if you present and are using PowerPoint like I am now, you may not know that PowerPoint has some great accessibility tools built in, including real-time subtitles. Let me show you what I mean. So if you're using PowerPoint, and you wanna have subtitles, you can just go to the slideshow setting, you see that, ar that arrow there, and then it gives you a chance to put up subtitles, either in the language you're speaking or to change the language. So I have this presentation set up for me to speak English and to translate into Spanish. And let me show you what that looks like. So now along the bottom of your screen, you should see what I'm saying instantly translated into Spanish. Pretty cool, huh? There you go. Accessibility is very doable. Uh, back in September, I attended this conference put on by the Communications Network. It was a virtual conference. This is a, a screen capture of one of their sessions. Look at what they did in this session. First of all, you see that box there? They had live American Sign Language uh, interpreters for anybody who needed ASL. And at the same time, they had computer-assisted real-time transcription, otherwise known as CART, so that you could read what was being said. You could even change the font size or the font, the font style to your liking. So this is doable. Third takeaway about the need for training. Take a moment to read this, please. So we asked this question in the survey. How would you describe the training that you have had to lead or facilitate convenings? And look at this. 35% to 48% of the people in the different categories, no training whatsoever. Now, anecdotally, the excuses we heard was, hey, look, in March, we were all thrown into this world. We had to do this. You know, who had time for training? We're too busy you know, doing what we're doing. We're, we're building the plane as we're flying it, right? Okay, well, that was March. It's October, folks. You know, I think by now, if you're going to be doing this all the time and we're going, to, we're going to keep doing it for several months, we should be investing in some training. As a result of this lack of training, here are some of the problems that I think we're seeing. We asked this question, how often did the facilitator or leader provide sufficient instructions at the beginning on how to use the tools? Basically, make sure that everyone knows how to play the game. And look at this, something that should be an always thing 57 to 71% of the time, sometimes or less often. 
okay? I just think, I think providing instructions at the beginning, unless you have a group of people who are meeting week in and week out, who know each other, same platform, you know that they're all proficient, fine, then you can skip it. But if you're cycling in new people, if you're doing webinars, like, you, like the center is doing, where you don't know how proficient people are, you got to just take a minute or two up front to make sure they know how to mute and unmute, you know, ask questions, turn on their video, turn off their video, deal with technical problems. If you don't do this, you're just inviting trouble. Another question we asked was, um, what are the challenges that face you when you lead or facilitate a meeting? And through our interviews, we identified seven challenges, which you see there on the left. And then we asked people to rate it on a, a scale of one to five as to which was the most challenging. And look what we found. For the person leading, paying attention to several simultaneous streams of information, you know, chat, questions, uh, you know, what's happening on screen, video boxes moving around stuff, it's hard. It's the number one or two problem across the board. So based on this data, some recommendations. Number one, get some training. There's plenty to be had. Uh, the various platforms have tutorials of their own to teach you how to make sure you use everything. There's plenty on YouTube. There's classes like this. Don't go it alone. At Casey Family Programs, they have a five-person team to help them do their webinars. So someone is focused on speaking and answering questions. Someone is managing the chat box. Someone is, is just dealing with technical issues. Someone else has built the slides. You know, don't go it alone. At the Goodman Center, we're a two-person team, me and Celia Hoffman. I handle most of the presenting. She's watching the chat box and doing the technical issues. And third, again, unless it's the same people week in and week out with the same platform, take a minute or two, cover the basics. Takeaway four about structure. Take a moment to read this, please. This was also one of the more interesting takeaways from the study. You know, think about the lives of the people on your team now working at home. They're distracted, they're pulled in many directions, they're attending all these meetings, you know, cats walking across keyboards and things like that. Um, so when they turn over an hour to you or more for a video conference, they crave structure. They want to know that they're gonna be well taken care of from start to finish. So one of the easiest ways to do that is to give them a very clear agenda up front that says, here's what we're doing in order. Here's how long we'll be spending on stuff. Here's who will be talking when, et cetera. Let them know exactly what to expect. They will feel much better to be in your hands then. How often did online convening leaders provide an agenda, which again, we think should be a basic thing. And look at this. Agendas are provided sometimes or less as much as half the time. We think it should be all the time. Doesn't have to be that complicated. An agenda like this up front, it just walks people through the other you know, five steps of the, of the meeting. Or if you have a webinar, a list of the learning objectives so people know what to expect. Uh, personally, I am a fan of the agendas that track progress as you go. Take a look at this agenda from Get to College. If you join this webinar midstream, and this slide came up on the screen, you would know instantly that they've covered sections one through three. We're now in four and five, and there's four more sections to go. You'd also know that this is a large three-part presentation, and according to those three bars on the left, we're in the middle part. And as the presentation moves along, this slide continues to update, checking off where you've been, showing you where you are, showing you where you're going. Spoon-feeding structure to the audience. And one more approach. Um, here's an agenda slide that shows you that there's five sections to this presentation. And you see that they're color coded, right? Let me show you this presentation in slide sorter mode so you can see all the slides. So you see what they've done? Section one is in green, section two is in blue, et cetera, et cetera. Just the color of the background is reminding the audience where they are in the presentation, making sure that the structure is visual as well as appearing on an agenda slide. Takeaway number five, 
about length and frequency. Take a moment to read this, please. This was another one of our big takeaways from the study. Um, people are, are worn out by video conferences. It's not the same thing as having meetings in a room together. It's different. It is more mentally taxing in many ways. We asked this question, how long are you spending in web-based convenings, vi video conferences in a typical week? And look where people ended up. Somewhere between uh, six and 20 hours was where the bulk of people f fell. So you can compare yourself to that. Does that about sound where you are? Somewhere between six and 20 hours a week staring at a screen. Now, this was interesting. We asked this question. We said, if you're in the hands of a skilled facilitator with an engaging pr you know, pr presentation, just, just consider a best case scenario. Could you remain focused and productive for any length of time up to eight hours? You know, Best case scenario, whether it's one long meeting or several meetings in a row, as good as it can be, can you be with us for eight hours? 54% said, yeah. You know, if I'm in good hands, if it's well done, I can be with you eight hours online. But 46% said no. I said, I don't care how good it is. I can't, I can't do it. Just can't do it. So I'm worried about that 46%. If we've got almost half the audience out there saying, I cannot do this all day long, where do we draw the line? So we asked this question. All right, so if you disagreed, if you said you can't do it, how long can you do it? And look what they told us. Somewhere between two and four hours a day is what they said, that, that'll work for me, two to four hours a day. Hold that thought. We asked this question, and Regina, I'm gonna call on you again here. We asked people, what amount of time do you feel would be the ideal length for a typical web meeting, webinar, webcast? Regina, to you, a web meeting, what's the ideal length of time? I mean, I realize that there are different factors and things like that, but if you had, to, if you were, if you were in charge, well, you are in charge. <laughs> <laughs> How long? You know, I see it at about an hour, at about 60 minutes. I start to see people get wiggly or mm -hmm. I see the faces go away and the names pop up. Yep. Um, so that's, that's for, how about for webinars? Any difference there? Do you get more time, less time? You know, um, we see at about 90 minutes and we've got to give people a break. Yep. Um, the longest we can keep people in total is about three hours, but we're really doing breaks. And um, that sort of combination of breakouts and polls and a total break. Like we've really worked hard to give people variety, you know, so that we can, that we're definitely seeing what you're seeing. Yeah. Okay. How about webcasts, you know, the, the really large scale things when you're talking about hundreds, if not a thousand people, any, any, any difference there? It, you know, near and dear to Aaron's heart, since he does our conferences and our bigger events, um, Aaron, I would defer to you. What do you think? What do you think, Aaron? Longer? I would guess in the 60 to 90 minutes, but potentially a little longer. Well, here's the survey results. And as you can see here, mm -hmm. 60 minutes or less yes. tends to be the sweet spot across the board. One more, one more bit of data. We asked people, how long can you go without a break? You know, if it, even if something needs to be 90 minutes, two hours, three hours, what's the longest chunk of time you can go without a break? And here people said, some people said as few as 30 minutes, some people said as, as long as 90 minutes, but no longer. So somewhere between 30 to 90 minutes is the ideal time. So recommendations, number one. Oh, sorry, let me go back. So, um, if, you want to so if you want to take a break, here's another little tip we have for you. Um, when you take a break in a webinar, webcast, web meeting, have a slide that looks like this. What this slide does is this slide has a timer on it. So we tell people we're going to take a 15 minute break and we tell them that we'll start the clock and keep an eye on it. When the clock gets to zero, um, you know, we're going to, uh, we're, we'll, we'll come back. That way, if someone joins your, your meeting midstream, rather than just having a blank screen and no sound and wondering what's going on, they, first of all, they have a slide that tells them. And secondly, now you see the timer going? Now you might say, that's cool. How do I do that? Well, I'll tell you, it's really easy. You go to YouTube, 
search countdown timer and you can download one of these things, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It's just, it's just a video that we've just taken and stuck up in the corner of a slide. That's really clever. <laughs> so here are the recommendations. Number one, we recommend that you not ask your people to, to spend more than four hours a day in online convenings of any kind. Just because of that 46% that just said, I cannot do any more than that. The, the people who can do more, great, you know, good for them. I don't wanna tax half my audience. Generally, if possible, limit convenings to one hour. Um, if it has to be longer, build in a break. And we recommend breaks, frankly, every 30 to 45 minutes. And when we take a break, we say, make it substantial, make it 10 or 15 minutes so people can get up, get away from that screen, stretch their legs, answer the call of nature, answer their email, then come back refreshed. Aaron, I wanna stop again to see if there's any questions that have come up in the chat box that we've missed uh, in the last few uh, things before we get to our final takeaways. Um, absolutely. Most of the questions, both public and private, are, are we going to get copies of these slides? Um, and I'm assuring everyone that you will get slides and a link to the study itself, um, because everybody is really enjoying and absorbing this information. Very um, good. Yes. The, the, the report, if you go to the, the goodmancenter.com, you can download the report for free, and I'll also make sure that you get a copy of the slides from the center. Okay. So yep. maybe another kind of direction and a question from Larry, which is not on the facilitator side, but on the participant side, that, you know, how do you create opportunities for people to feel like they're connecting with each other, right? Because that's the other piece they're missing, right, in this virtual world. I think this breakout music. rooms are, yeah. are really your best tool there. And you can use breakout rooms very creatively. I've seen meetings where they've had large groups, like, you know, 50 or 100, and they'll create breakout rooms of two people each. You know, you, you've seen it in in-person meetings when they'll do like a, what they call pair and share, you know, at your table, turn the person next to you and have a quick conversation. Well, you can create two person breakout rooms where you throw people in them, have them do something and then come back. So I think that that's your best single tool for taking large gatherings and making sure everybody feels connected and participates, whether it's two people in a room or five or more. All right. Takeaway number six about preferred platforms. Take a moment to read this. I don't think there's any big surprise here. You've been reading for, for in many places about the popularity of Zoom. In our survey, we asked people to list their five top platforms that they use um, and also to rate them on a one to five scale. All convenings, that top category there means not only for professional, but personal use. You know, what are you using the most? Then for meetings, webinars, and webcasts, and as you can see clearly, Zoom is the most used and also the highest rated. People have the most satisfaction with Zoom across the board. So when people ask us, you know, what platform do you recommend? Uh, we usually say Zoom, but the reason we say Zoom is because, because there's such high familiarity with it, um, it's very easy to tell people to use it because you know that coming in that they'll be comfortable and will use it. That said, all platforms are evolving very quickly with new technologies and some of these could be game changers. Um, if you're a sports fan like I am and you watch the NBA playoffs, you saw this on your screen, what looks like a bunch of people in the stands. What you're actually looking at there was Microsoft Teams together mode where they can take individuals you know, looking into a camera like you are, pull them out of whatever setting they're in and put them into what looks like a group setting, like sitting in a seats in an arena. Now, the, the value for a business setting is you can also do that and put people like they're sitting in an auditorium or around a conference table or in a coffee house. The benefit of this is not just that it you know, looks cool, but it, it actually is less mentally taxing. Um, when you have together mode, you process it, your eyes and your mind process it as looking at one location that has 16 people in it, as opposed to 16 different TV shows on the same time where I have to watch each box. So together mode, and my understanding is I think that Zoom may have recently copied this, um, is something that changes people's actual experience of video conferencing. So the point being that as technologies change, Zoom is everyone's favorite right now, but who knows, you know, a year from now, it could be, it could be the video conferencing, what MySpace is to the, the web, you know, it could be the thing that came before the next big thing. Takeaway number seven, 
personal video feeds, camera on or off. Take a moment to read this. You know, this may seem like a little thing, but boy, the little things make a big difference because your personal experience of a video conference can change by the fact of, is your camera on or off? We ask people this question. If you're able to join via video, how often do you prefer having your video stream on, having your camera on? And look at this. For meetings, which tend to be smaller, more, more participatory, more interaction, the majority of people said, yes, on. But for webinars like today or webcasts, uh, more people say off. I, you know, I don't need to be seen, don't want to be seen. Um, a lot of people told us, you know, and they had, they had very different reasons. Some people said, I like having it on because um, it, it helps me concentrate. I feel part of the group. I see other people. I feel included, less isolated. And some people said, no, I prefer to have it off. It's distracting. I end up looking at myself or other people. Or I feel like it's an invasion of my privacy. I don't want people looking into my bedroom. So very strong opinions on either side. So here's what we recommend. We think that you can kind of have the best of both worlds. We tell people in our webinars at the Goodman Center that when we start, we ask people as they enter to turn it on so we can say hello and welcome them. So it's the moral equivalent of standing at the conference room door and saying, hi, Aaron, nice to see you, Regina, come on in, et cetera. Um, but once we get underway and we're in the presentation, then we've said, we recommend turn them off. We think that you'll be more distracted than helped by it. And we all want to focus on the slides if that's what we're talking about. But when we stop for questions and comments, turn them back on so we can see you as you ask your question and we can all have a conversation. We might even stop sharing the slides entirely just so we can see each other, as I said earlier to Regina. But all of that said, we always give participants the option to choose. We say, it's up to you. If on makes you more comfortable all the time, you do you. If off is better, that's fine too, because your comfort level is the most important uh, um, part of this, of this equation. If you want to be engaged in participating, I don't want you to be uncomfortable. So we always leave it up to them. Takeaway number eight about the slides. Take a moment to read this, please. You know, when you give a presentation in person, the more interesting your slides are, the more readable, the more active, et cetera, the more that you can pull people's eyes to the screen and keep them focused and attentive in a room. Well, in a video conference, it's that times 10 because the tendency to look away is so much greater. You know, there's, there's no pressure. People can't see you, you know, looking away. It can, it can almost look like you're still concentrating. So the, 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 the tendency to look away, to multitask, it's just so much greater that you need to do even more to make your slides eye-catching. You know, in general, there's, there's satisfaction. We ask people, are you liking the slides you're seeing in these remote meetings? And people generally are. Almost 40 to 49%, which is actually a high percentage, say frequently to always, slides are enhancing the experience. So we're seeing generally a high level of satisfaction. But if your slides look like this, come on, this is not interesting to look at. I mean, let's be honest. If these are your slides, this can be very important, useful information, but this is not interesting to look at. So one of the things we recommend is have two sets of slides. We learned this by uh, one, of the, or one of the best examples we saw was from CES, the Center for Effective Services, uh, based in Ireland. They have offices in uh, Belfast and Dublin. They have a presentation here, reaching out, supporting families. Within this presentation was a slide that looked like this. Now you see on the right, you see those six bullet points? That's the most important part of this slide. That's where they're talking about how to create a safe environment for sharing. But there's a lot of text there. You don't want to put this up on the screen. This is, this is, this is too much text. So what they did was they created a slide that looks like this that has those six bullet points, but translates them into colorful icons with just a minimum amount of text. So now when they do the presentation, on the left, that's what the presenter has in front of her to remind her what to say. And they'll send that same slide out later as a handout to make sure that people have all the information. But on the right, that's what goes up on the screen to keep it visually interesting. So two sets of slides. Generally, you wanna have as little text in the slide as possible. Things like footnotes, citations, like I said earlier, 
get them off your slides. Those can go in the chat box or send it later as a bibliography. Just have as little visual noise as, as you want, as you can. And if you had text that you do want people to read, then we recommend you do something like this. This is, by the way, one of the immutable laws of presenting, whether in person or via remote. If you put text up on a screen in a room or this way, people will want to read it. So if you read it to them, you're insulting their intelligence. If you're saying something else while they're reading, you're annoying them. So if you want them to read the text, take a breath, let them read, and then add something to it. And the design, the style of your slide will, say, will convey substance as well. If you're talking about your vision, as educators for fair consideration are here, your vision should be inspiring, right? This is your vision. This is what's getting people to say, I'm gonna do it with you. Well, this slide is not inspiring. It's just words on a, on a white background. Now, deeper within this same presentation were some wonderful pictures. So we told them, for your vision slide, why not take one of those pictures Put it in the backdrop so people see actual human beings as part of your vision, these wonderful kids that you work with. Style conveys substance. And lastly, two words, always build. When you have a slide with multiple bullet points or multiple, uh, multiple elements, if you build it gradually in front of people, it keeps them focused where you want them focused and creates more action on the screen. This slide from one of our earlier storytelling webinars fails on two levels. First of all, it's not visually interesting to look at. Here we are talking about story structure, something that could be graphic and, and schematic, and it's just words on a page. And secondly, all five bullets are presented at once. So if I'm the presenter and I'm walking you through this slide and I'm talking about bullet number one, what are you doing? You're reading all five because they're there. So you read all five, you go, okay, I got it. But Andy's still talking about bullet number one, so I'm going to go check my email until he catches up with me. We redesigned the slide to look like this. Now when we talk about the protagonist, the first bullet point, you got something to look at there that's interesting. And you got nothing else to do, so you got to stay with me until I bring up the next element and tell you about that, and the next after that, and gradually build the slide in front of you until it's all there, keeping you focused where I want you focused. You can do this with something as mundane as a bar graph. This is from our friends at the Natural Resource Governance Institute. This was a presentation in Central America and South America covering five different regions. Again, you put this all up on the screen at once, the audience is gonna speed read it, make their own decisions. And then while they're waiting for you to catch up, they're gonna go do something else. But if instead you cover those bars and gradually reveal them one by one as you talk about them, you keep them focused where you want them focused. And the action on the screen, the actual motion, attracts your attention and constantly recues visual interest. What this suggests is that it's actually helpful to have a lot of slides. If you're constantly moving from slide to slide with animation within slides, then this is busy, this is active. For this presentation alone today, there's over 120 slides in this deck. And I don't think it's been frantic. I think hopefully it's been interesting and been active. Last takeaway, long-term trends. Please take a moment to read this. Again, the data told us something interesting here. We asked people, before the pandemic began, how often were you working from home? And look at what people told us. 19% of, of those responding said, yeah, I'm, I'm already working from home. It's already part of what I do. When the pandemic hit, how many people had to work from home? 90%. Some people were still able to go into the office or, or had to, but 90% were working at home. But here's the payoff question. We said, when you're able to go back to your office, do you anticipate still working at home? So 19% pre-pandemic, but when we get into post-pandemic, someday, 48%, half still think they'll be working at home. So this notion that 
things have changed and will have changed forever. The data is confirming that. So if you know that people on your team, many will still be working at home, there's some things to pay attention to. We ask people, how conducive is your home workspace in terms of, do you have enough room? Is it too distracting? What's the noise level like on a one to five rating scale? And fortunately, most people said, I'm already, I'm four to five. So these people are very fortunate. Not everyone is so fortunate, but responds to this survey, mostly fell in the four to five range. I got a good workspace at home. We asked, do you have the proper resources there? You know, the computer, the printer, paper, et cetera, et cetera. And again, uh, in this case, 77% in the four to five range. So we're a very fortunate group, uh, us nonprofits, foundations, colleges and universities. But where we spotted a little trouble was about internet speed. Does the speed of your connection negatively affect your experience? Because a slow connection can ruin this whole thing. And look at this. 46% said sometimes, frequently, or always, a bad internet connection is making things bad for me. So based on this, you have to make sure that your team members have sufficient internet speeds at home. There's a, a website called Speed Test, there are others like it, where they can find out what their upload speed and download speed is. And you gotta make sure that they're sufficient because if this doesn't work, then none of the content matters. Some resources to go deeper before we stop one more time for questions and wrap up. Because accessibility is so important, uh, there are some websites you can go to. Section508.gov talks about if you're creating PowerPoint or Word documents to make sure that they're accessible, you know, the right font sizes, colors, contrasts, free advice right there, section508.gov. Also, webaim.org. Again, if you're interested in accessibility, lots of good resources here. And if you are doing presentations online, very much like today, I've become a big fan of the presentation podcast. These are presentation experts talking about how to give good presentations. And if you look at their recent offerings, look at that, episode 104, how are the remote presentation meetings going? 101, slide design for remote presenting. They're very much focused on presenting in this world, the presentation podcast. And on our website, thegoodmancenter.com, you can download this report, plus our earlier books about presentations and also um, advertising. And with that, um, I'd like to stop once more for questions and then uh, bring it back because I have one last thought I wanna share with you before we call it a day. Aaron, Regina, any other questions in the chat box or anything on your minds before we wrap up? There was one that popped up um, on a private message that I would love your feedback on. Um, but asking, how would you engage audience members that don't have access to a camera but are joining a webinar specifically? That's, you know, if you have people who um, aren't on camera, um, you know, it, it's, good, it's good to know in advance what people's capability are. Um, prior to Goodman Center webinars, we will always send people an email that asks them, do you have any accessibility issues, any issues with how you'll be joining? We identify those people in advance and then we try and meet their needs. Sometimes it's a matter of sending them the slides in advance so that they have them printed out in front of them. Uh, if, they, if they know they'll be there, but they can't be on camera, we'll, we'll talk, we'll say, would you like to be called on? The more work you do prior to the webinar to identify what people's needs are and how they wanna be treated, the better the experience will be. A Little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you wanna stay in touch, we do a monthly newsletter called Free Range Thinking, which is only about best practices and communications in the public interest sector. Just go to our website, thegoodmancenter.com, give us your email address, we'll send it to you once a month, and we won't do anything else with your email address, just send you the newsletter. Also, I tweet under the name Goodman Center, so if I see something timely, oh, there's a documentary on tonight, just saw a great article in the Times, et cetera, I'll tweet you a link to that. So if you wanna follow me, at Goodman Center. And also we do lots of webinars too about strategic communications, presentations, storytelling, et cetera. So check out one of the other classes. Uh, you might find something good there. All right, last thought before I turn it back to Aaron and Regina. Um, last thought is about this guy, Robert Kelly. Now, I don't know if you remember Robert Kelly. Uh, he is a professor at Pusan University in, the, in South Korea, an expert on South Korean affairs. And back in 2017, he was being interviewed on the BBC about an impeachment scandal. And something funny happened to him that made him an internet meme uh, for, for people all over the world. Take a look.
scandals happen all the time. The question is, how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region. Do you think relations with the north may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the um, pardon me. My apologies. <laughs> What is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months to a year. Because so that was 2017, and we all had a good laugh back then. But I don't think what we didn't realize was that we were seeing a sneak preview of the future, because. As one uh, Twitter commentator said after seeing that uh, m played more recently, uh, we are all Robert Kelly now. So our last piece of advice to you today is this. We're, we're professionals like Robert Kelly. We're working hard. We're trying to do our best, but stuff happens. And so give yourself and give others the space and grace that this time requires, and we'll all get through it together. With that, I just want to say thank you to Regina and Aaron and everybody at the Center for Nonprofit Management for giving me this opportunity. And before I go, one last thing. Go Dodgers. Thanks, everybody. Well, as you might have noticed, Aaron and I are in Dodger blue today with our background. So we're with you on that one, Andy. It's a big one. So thank you. All the feedback in the chat was how much they love this presentation. I knew it was going to be great and um, gave us all something to think about. And um, you're right, during our conference, we had one of our plenary speakers, <laughs> their child went ballistic in the middle of his remarks. And the whole audience of hundreds of people just laughed because we're all in it together right now. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your expertise and all these really important tips. And to everybody that joined today, it was good to see you all and we'll see you again in about two weeks, I think. So thank you, Aaron, for keeping it going. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining. Um, thank you, Andy, so much. Um, and as we mentioned, we'll be sending out copies of the slides, links to the resources that were mentioned um, in the presentation, in the chat, and a recording of the whole session today um, in case you missed any of it um, or want to share it with anybody else. Um, and with that, we'll wrap up the session. Um, thank you so much for joining. Hope you have a great, uh, great weekend. And everybody, uh, stay safe and healthy. Thanks so much. Bye, Jill. Ha, 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 ha.